Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Brother Zach, thanks for preaching for us tonight. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Pastor. If you'll take your Bibles with me, please, and turn to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 31 is the last chapter before we start looking into the book of 2 Samuel. Aren't you glad God's power is never ending, never changing? It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Tonight there's going to be something interesting that I would like for you to look at as we look at together. And God really put something on my heart. This past few weeks and months, I've really been studying the life of David because the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And I wanted to understand what that meant. Why did David have a heart after God so earnestly, but yet he still failed and sin every day like you and I? So I wanted to dig, dig, dig a little bit deeper. Here in chapter 31 tonight, we're going to be looking at King Saul and how Saul was jealous of David and how Saul was anointed by Samuel. And some people say, well, I really don't understand the lineage. Well, let me try to break it down for you. First, we see Moses and Aaron deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. They wandered in the, year, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Then we see Joshua taking over as Moses dies, and we see the, the creation of the 12 tribes of Israel, Judah being the one that's really leading the charge. And then after Joshua, the death, we see now the judges taking charge. We see 12 specific judges leading the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's quite interesting how chronologically this begins to connect because now the people, as they have done their entire time of freedom, they begin to complain and murmur, well, we don't want judges, we want a king. We want a ruler like everybody else. We don't want to be separated, we want to be like everybody else. So the Lord then rises up King Saul. And you look at the life of Saul, Saul was a very simple man. One day his father said, all of my mules, all of my asses have gone missing, I need you to take another and go find them. And it's quite interesting, yet while he's on that adventure looking for those mules, that Samuel, a prophet of God, comes to him by, by the way of the Lord and says, you are the chosen one. And now he's the king of Israel. God raises this man up to lead his people. Aren't you thankful for pastor and how God has led him here to lead our church? I'm thankful for a man of God who stands firm on the word of God, who doesn't yield or he doesn't stand, stand weary, he stands firm. And as I was thinking about the life of David and now King Saul, we see the, now that King Saul is king and we see what's taking place. And through it all, we notice that David comes along and out of the twelve, he's the youngest. And the same one who anointed him, Samuel, comes and anoints David right before he takes on Goliath. Right? And I was texting pastor this week because I always wondered why did David pick up five smooth stones? Why? I could never understand what the four other stones he needed. Was he doubting God? Was he doubting the representation of God? But as you study the Word of God, it was actually for the giant's four sons. That day in battle, he said, I'm going to take five stones. Because not only am I going to kill the giant, but I, just in case his sons decide to come off that valley and down here toward me, I have four other stones to be have the opportunity, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, kill them. Here we notice that the Israelites were fighting the Philistines. But one interesting thing tonight, before we get into chapter 31, last thing I want to catch you up with is, God told Saul very specifically, don't kill the Philistines. I want you to kill the Amalekites. But, call, but Saul said, no, I'm going to chase the thorn that's in my side. I'm going to chase the problem that I've been fighting from the beginning, and they're the Philistines. Tonight I want to see something very, very specific. If I were to title this message, it would be, Our enemies are great, but our God is greater. Aren't you glad that the will of God is greater than we could ever imagine? There's going to be a lot of times in life you're wondering, well, why is this happening? Why is this taking place? I'm not really sure. God, I'm, I'm faithful. God, I'm praying. Lord, I'm reading my Bible. But yet God's will is greater than we can ever imagine. Before we begin tonight, let's pray and ask God to meet with us. And can I ask you specifically tonight to pray for me? I'm just a man, just like you. 
right? I'm a sinful person, just like you, right? God says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I'm begging God to do something amazing here tonight, and I'm asking you to pray with me and for me as I pray aloud. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Straightway Baptist Church. Thank you so much for the leadership of our pastor. Thank you for the leadership of our deacons. Thank you for the leadership that you provided, Lord, that we can be the example to those who are all around us. Thank you, Lord, for answering prayer and opening doors at these, uh, the, older, the elderly homes. Lord, I, I pray for those people, Lord, even now. Father, I pray that we'll be able to take the word to them. Lord, I pray for every person here tonight. God, I pray they lay all distractions aside, turn their phones off, silence them. Lord, whatever they have to do, Lord, to be able to focus. Father, I pray for those who may be even tired this very moment. Lord, I know how easy it is to be tired after a long week and not much rest. God, I pray you make them uncomfortable that they may stay awake. Lord, I'm trying to be honest with you tonight because, Lord, I think about the disciples in the garden as they were falling asleep as you asked them to pray. God, we as a church need to pray. God, we as a church need to stand stronger than ever and together. God, I'm asking for the will of God for this church tonight. Lord, as we know, Saul was disobedient. He didn't listen and did what he wanted to do. And so, Lord, we'll see what happened exactly to him. Father, I pray that not happen to us. Lord, this is your church, and upon this rock you will build it. God, help us to be instruments used by you and for you this morning, this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow, all the days of the rest of our lives, Lord, to be a part of your church. Lord, we know the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All the things that you said are going to happen are beginning to happen. Lord, Lord, even now, the Euphrates River is drying up. God, I'm asking you to do something here tonight that only you can do. Please, Father, hide me behind the cross. Speak through me. God, I pray that I'm only a vessel. Please, Father, forgive me for my sins, for my iniquities, my besetting sins, my habitual sins. Father, I pray there would be no, be sin, there would be no sin between you and I at this very moment. God, I thank you so much for this opportunity. I pray that I never take it for granted. And Lord, I do pray. Lord, if there, one, if there is one among us tonight that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Lord, help them not to leave this building unsure. Lord, you are the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way but through the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, for this moment. I pray, Lord, that our hearts be earning for you. I pray that our eyes and hearts be burning, Lord, to be able to see people saved and see lives changed. I thank you. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. As we look into the life of King Saul, as we see in chapter 31, verse, in verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down and slain in Mount Gilbeo. If you think about this battle, you think about Saul and David and how we think that we might know everything about what's taking place, but in reality, we don't know everything. But what we do know is what is taking place is David, the moment he defeated Goliath and the moment he was preparing for all the battles to come and how he became a great captain of the army, Saul became to, be, to have become very jealous of David. As one battle took place and they were walking back into the kingdom, all these ladies around were talking about, oh, King Saul, he killed thousands, but yet King, but David killed tens of thousands. Can I be honest with you tonight? It seems as though jealousy runs rampant these days. It seems the, the power of our enemy is great. But we have to be honest with each other and ourselves and God tonight that the power of God is greater. We don't have to worry about what each other have or what each other have done or is going to do. What we have to worry about today is what God is doing through us to reach the unreachable. Do you know tonight there's so many people that aren't here that should be here? Do you know tonight there's many that aren't in this room who I've, been, who I've seen in this room and have been very faithful? But yet they're letting the power of the world, the power of sin, the power of our enemy to keep them out of this building. It's the truth. The old saying is, truth hurts, and it really does. As we take a look tonight in the life of Saul, we see something that went from something so little and became so great. Saul was anointed by God. He was God's chosen man. He stood a head and shoulders above all men. It doesn't say exactly how tall he was, 
But he was chosen because of his height, his stature. Here in a moment we see is that height and that stature didn't mean much anymore. In verse 2, the, the Bible says, And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Mish- Malachishu and Saul's son. Now we see, not only did Saul die, but his three sons perished with him. Can I be honest with you tonight? And I hope that we can be honest with ourselves. The battle that we fight, the battle that's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rule of darkness, it never stops. Until the day of redemption, until the day of the return, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, that battle will never stop. Not only are we fighting against those things, but we're fighting against ourselves, our old way, our old nature, just like the Israelites for 40 years fought against themselves. They doubted God and God proved them. They doubted God continuously and God continued to prove Himself to them. As I was thinking about Pastor this past Wednesday, in Moses' anger, he struck the rock twice, but yet God said to speak to the rock. Think about this for a moment. Moses raised up under Pharaoh. He knew all the things of the king. He knew all the things that were taking place. He went out of the wilderness and he came back because God brought him back. God prepares us for everything we're going to go through and face. God prepared him and used him greatly. But because of the people he sinned, he let that anger and wrath come upon him and instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. How often do we let people influence us? Here we see King Saul being influenced by the people around him and not by God. The reason that he died this very moment, because God said to him, go and kill the Amalekites. These are the people I want you to destroy. This is the land of the milk and honey. This is the promised land that I have given you. This is what I want you to have. But yet, let's be real tonight. He chases the thorn in his side and not the will of God. How often do you and I chase the thorn that's in our side that we think is so huge, so overwhelming, and we don't chase the will of God? You know what's amazing about the body? If I get a splinter in my finger or in some part of my body, over time my body will reject it and push it out. Isn't that amazing? How often do we get so focused on the thorn that is in our side, the burden, the heavy weight, the things that are going on, the why me, Lord, why is this happening, I don't understand. We get so focused on that and not the will of God. God says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He never said it would be easy. He never said that your net wouldn't come up empty. But He says, be faithful. If God is faithful, why are we not? Here, the Philistines, people are like, where did the Philistines even come from? The Philistines were actually the descendants of Noah's son, Ham. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Then we see that Israel fought with the Philistines all the way up to the days of the Babylonian Empire. Until captivity again, right? Not only do we see that they fought the Philistines, but seven major battles in the Bible took place. Seven is a number of completion in the Bible. During this battle, we see that Saul and his three sons and all of his men were killed in this valley all because of Saul's disobedience. Do you know how many people today leave church, walk out the door, and never come back because of something someone said? They've got their feelings hurt. It's interesting when you look around tonight, the people who are here compared to the people that were here this morning. It's quite interesting when people, when I hear people say, well, I get enough church on Sunday morning. I'm not sure how you can get enough church in a day when church is supposed to be for eternity. Church is not the building. Church is not coming and hearing the word. The church is being a part of the body of believers. Because if we have to fight a battle, which one day we will, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns for a thousand years, We'll have to be standing shoulder to shoulder fighting against then flesh and blood, principalities, powers, rules of darkness. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, this is my kingdom and I will return. I will fight for it. 
right? And one day God's going to call his bridegroom up. I hope today that you can say, Brother Zach, I'm going to be right there with you. I know that I'm, I know that I'm saved for a shadow of a doubt. I know that I'll be there. Because Romans 8.8 8 says this, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. How often do we allow the flesh to control us? Just like Saul here as battling the Philistines out of the will of God, not fighting against the people that God told him to fight, he was in the flesh because he was dealing with jealousy. He was dealing with anger and frustration. But not only that, what is most interesting, if you look at chapter 28, you don't have to do it right now this very moment, but if you'd like to go back and study out the Word of God, chapter 28, we see the hand of God being removed from, the, from King Saul. Because here we know that, the, that God sent Samuel to King Saul and says, what are you doing? God called you to do this and you're not doing it. But Samuel says, yes, I am. He tries to make excuses. Yes, I am. I'm doing the will of God. But yet, fully, he was not. He was allowing selfishness and himself to overcome the things that God had called him to do. Then we see the life and the death of Samuel, and then Saul turns to witchcraft. Can you imagine? Can you, can, can you imagine this? Being anointed by God, being used by God in all of these battles, and you're leading the kings, you're leading all of the Israelites, and you turn to witchcraft. He turns to this witch and says, I need your help. I no longer have Samuel. I no longer have a prophet. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. What am I supposed to do? And the witch raises up Samuel. Samuel says, what, what do you want with me? And Samuel tells him plain and simple, Saul, you've disobeyed God. Saul, you've gone in your own way, your own flesh, your own direction, your own desires. By this time tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. He falls on the floor in front of this witch and begins to weep and thrash in the floor and he says, what have I done? Can I ask you to be honest with yourself tonight? As a church, as members of this church, are we in the will of God? Are we doing what God has commanded us and asked us to do? This doesn't mean on Sundays and Wednesdays, folks. This means every day of your life living by faith. Seeking the will of God. Asking God to move. Using you to see people saved. Listen, you don't save people, but God wants you to use you to take the word of God into the highways and hedges and compel those to come in. Amen. Do you remember the day you were saved? Do you remember the moment you got right with God? Do you remember when all things were gone away and all things become new? Tonight in your life, if you don't know or see the things changing, if you're used to living the old way and you're still living in sin, you're still doing the things you used to do, maybe tonight is the night to get right with God. Amen. He is the way. Amen. He is the truth. In Galatians 5.16, the Bible says, Then I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If Saul would have realized beforehand, even when Samuel came to him and said, Listen, Saul, you're not in the will of God. If he would have just listened to Samuel, what a difference there could have been made this day. Because in verse 3 it says, And then the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded, of the archers. And what's interesting, if you study this out, the archers, they were such a far distance away, the archers didn't even know that they had struck Saul with an arrow. It's quite interesting because later on we'll see why. And as the archers struck him, he laid on the ground. He didn't know what to do, but he knew that his wounds would, would, would take his life. And as he began to wallow there, I can only imagine gasping for air and trying to think about his life flashing before his eyes and Verse 4, and it says, And then Saul said Saul unto the armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust through me. Through therewith, lest their uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword, just a sword off the battlefield, and fell upon it. Saul took his 
life that day, or he thought he was taking his life that day. For time's sake, I'm just going to tell you what happened in 2 Samuel chapter 1. We see David going back and trying to figure out what happened and how the anointed died, and yet we come to find out that a Amalekite, the one that, that Saul was supposed to be seeking, went and took a sword and cut his head off. He actually didn't fully kill himself when he fell upon the sword, but the one who he was sent to kill, killed him. Do You know, we have the same thing today. His name's Satan. You know, the Satan is not this red, horned, pointy tail, pitchfork carrion. The Bible said he was the most beautiful angel. He was above the cherubim. He was a, the, the voice of music. He's tempting. He's beautiful. He's luscious. You know, it seems as though people fall by the eyesight because it's so hard to, to believe on something I cannot see, but yet if I see it, I want it. I desire it. I long for it. How often do we long for the Lord Jesus Christ? How often do we say, Lord, I'm ready. Come now. Can we be honest with each other tonight? Not only do we see that the battle never stops, but do you know our sin brings forth death? What I mean is not a spiritual death. The Bible specifically calls it a stumbling block. Do you know your actions right now today and for all of eternity, people are looking at you? They'll always be looking at you? Because it's easy to say, Brother Zach, I'm a Christian. I go to church on Sundays. I pray. I read my Bible. I go to church on Wednesdays. But what do people know about you outside these doors? How do people see you? Do they see you full of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, fervence, faith, the fruits of the Spirit? Or do they see you walking around in your own lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? Are they seeking your own pleasures and your own things you desire and the things you want to do? Or do they see you living for the Lord Jesus Christ? Because here we know Saul, the anointed of God, he lived a righteous life until he allowed the world, the things of the world, his flesh. He's so prideful, he even at one point tried to make his own statue of himself in a valley because of a battle that he won. He allowed himself to overcome the will of God. And he died because of it. How many people does your actions influence on a day-to-day -day basis? Saul was a man of victory. He won many battles before and after he was a king. Because of Saul's sins, his sons also died in the valley that day. They were fighting the Philistines because Saul thought he knew better than God. Can I be honest with you and you be honest with me? How often do we think we know better than God? You know, I once heard, a good idea fairy is great to have, but is it really the will of God? Can I be even more honest with you? I remember graduating Bible college, and my wife could testify to this. I wanted to be in ministry so bad. I was so on fire. I could not wait to get in ministry. You know, I'm thankful God sent my wife, and I told her this last night. Because I used to be like being in the army, I used to try to kick doors open. I'd be like, I'm going to kick Satan right in the face. I can't wait. But what I realized is I can't do anything without God. I can't live. I can't breathe. I can't walk. I can't talk. I can't be a husband. I can't be a father. I can't do anything. I can kick a door open, but is that really the will of God for my life? You and I, we can walk up to a an handle and twist it and jiggle it. It may open. But is that really the will of God for your life? Because here we saw that, we saw that Saul, right? Saw that Saul. <laughs> Everybody's just not get it. We see that Saul took the, the, the reins of his life into his own hands. He thought that he knew better. He didn't want to fight the, Am the Amalekites. He wanted to fight the Philistines because they were the thorn in his side. Think about this. David was 13 to 17 years old when he defeated Goliath. Here, right after this, when, when David becomes king, he's 33 years old. Right? So a rough period of time of 15 to 17 years, the same Philistines that they were fighting are the same Philistines they're fighting still here. And Saul wants to defeat them. He says, I'm going to defeat them. 
because he thought it was his way was perfect. But the Bible says that God's way is perfect. God said, this, this isn't what I told you to do. You and I need to lay down the reins of our life, throw them down, stomp on them, kick them in the dirt. Because the more you and I try to take over, the worse things are going to get. You know, I was thinking about, you know, I'll be honest with you, I fell asleep in church too before. I was thinking about this. My wife's giggling. I've been tired. I get it. It's hard to come back on Sunday nights, but it's what we're supposed to do. The Bible says to be found faithful. But think about this. Sitting in the garden right before He was going to the cross, Jesus says, go and pray. And what they do? They fell asleep. It's easy to fall asleep, isn't it, Brother Frank? Oh, yeah. I love to sleep, man. I'm a sleeper. I love to sleep. But if I'm sleeping, I'm not accomplishing the will of God. Think about this. They fell asleep in the garden that day and God told them to pray. It's easy to come to church. Right? The devil wants you to fall asleep. The devil doesn't want you to hear the Word of God. The devil doesn't want your heart to be challenged. We should be better uncomfortable than we are outside the will of God. You know, I was once told I like to do mixed martial arts, and one of my professors said, get used to being uncomfortable. Because your whole life you're going to be uncomfortable, and you're not going to like it. But if you get used to it, you're going to survive. We need to get used to being uncomfortable because God didn't say it to be easy. God says be faithful. And I will get you from point A to point B if you trust me. If a faith of a mustard seed would move a mountain, the faith of a mustard seed would move a mountain, right? Why are we trying to move mountains on our own? Why are we trying to pick up rock by rock and shovel by shovel and trying to move all these mountains when God says be faithful? Here, Saul, all he had to do was be faithful, but he allowed his sins to bring forth death. In James 1, 12 and through 15, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. You know, I've read that verse a lot in my life. And there's something that stuck out to me this week that I've never seen before, and I'm going to read it right now. But, every man is tempted, listen to me now, when he is drawn away of his own lust. Think about that for a moment. God says, I will not tempt you because I am not the tempter, but... Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. Saul was drawn away by his power and the things and the authority that he had been given. But yet, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. It starts with lust, and what I mean, it starts with your eyes and it ends in death. Could you imagine tonight what it would be like if we were all blind? Take a moment, just close your eyes. What do you see? Nothing. Darkness, right? You can't see anything. Close your eyes for me. It's okay. I won't punch you in the face. All you see is darkness. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the light. But not only is He the light, you can open your eyes. Because God says, let me be your eyes. I will show you and guide you the way. I will teach you in the ways to go. If you study, you will know, show thyself approved. You know, it's easy to sit there and read the Bible. Oh yeah, I checked the book. I, I checked the box. I read the Word. But are we really studying it for the truth? Or are we just trying to say, yeah, I read it today. Are we just trying to read a chapter or two or a verse or two? How about we get in the Word of God like we never have before? Not only should we read the Bible through every year, but chronologically we could see and understand what God is doing through these 44 
books of the Bible. 66 books, sorry. 66 books of the Bible. Not only does sin bring forth death, but ultimately we see that our enemy controls the, the power of fear. In verse number 5, excuse me, in verse number, yes, 5, and when his armor bearer Saul, that Saul was dead, he fell like was upon his sword and died with him. There was no reason for him to kill himself that day. So Saul died with his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men the same day together. Do you know Saul reigned for 40 years and fought the Philistines his entire life? His entire life, entire time of leadership, he fought the, the Philistines. The Philistines, here when we saw the word sore, it means bringing pain and stress against King Saul. Just how Saul was defeated and his men chased out. Can we be honest with each other tonight? We've got to be careful. Because that same power that's working against you and I is the same power that's trying to close the doors of these churches. If you look at the percentages of churches that are closing today in America, it's scary. Pastors resigning because they just don't feel like it anymore. Pastors resigning because the people aren't coming anymore. The people aren't coming, I'm not sure why. People are like, well, I'm not getting fed, Brother Zach. You're not? The Word of God says it will never return void. That means it's your heart that's rejecting the Word. You're rejecting God. Maybe there's sin in your life that you just enjoy too much to get right with God. Let's be real tonight. I'm not here to step on toes. I'm not here to change your heart. I'm here to tell you the truth. Because without the power of God in our lives, we have nothing. Let me say that one more time. Without the power of God in our lives, we have nothing. You can be saved for a day or for 20 years. If you don't have the power of God in your life right now, just like Saul, he had the power of God in the beginning and he let it all go. He himself chose to let it go and he lost the power of God. He lost God's favor, God's anointing. I'm not saying he lost his salvation, but he rejected the Lord Jesus Christ through and through. Because even Samuel says, this time tomorrow you'll be, you and your three sons will be with me. Can we stop rejecting God and God's will? Can we seek the face of God and His perfect will for our lives? Because if not, we're going to end up just like King Saul. In verse 6, it says, So Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men that same day together. Think about this. Just a few, few chapters before this, Jonathan himself killed over 250 soldiers just he himself so if he himself could kill 250 soldiers can you imagine the amount of philistines it took to kill saul his three sons now his armor bearer takes his own life because of, because of the sin that's in saul's life this many people died because of sin in proverbs 14 12 the bible says there is a way which seemeth right unto man but the end, therefore, are the ways of death. This is the truth. And people ask, well, how do you know it's true? Because it's proved me wrong over and over and over and over and over and over again. The Bible says, well, or someone always says, well, how do you know it's, it's all there? Or how do you know the translation's right? Or how do you know it's real? Try it. Ask God to prove Himself. Ask God to move in your life. Just like in the Bible, the young man said, Lord, I don't know if I believe, but, if, but if, if it be so, take this rug and make it wet and the, and the land around it be dry. The next morning he woke up and the rug was wet and the land was dry. He says, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't do it yet. Lord, if I really want to believe, I want the land to be wet and the rug to be dry. The next morning he woke up, the land was wet and the rug was dry. He still didn't want to believe. Sure is. Did he? What are you believing today? 
Are you trusting social media, the news, the things that people post, the things that people say? Are you trusting men or are you trusting the Lord Jesus Christ? He is the author and finisher of our faith. That means in the beginning you confessed your sins. You got right with God and asked you to save you. And when He finishes us the day we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, He doesn't judge us upon our sin. He simply judges us on the things we did for Him. Can I be honest with you? You don't have to wait till Saturday to go soul winning. You can do it every single day. Should you be at church on Wednesdays? Absolutely. Should you be on church on Sundays? Absolutely. Are there things that happen in life that may keep you from here? Absolutely. But there's still a hundred times, a hundred different ways you can access church. But you know what happens? I'm going to be real with you. We get, comfor- we, we get comfortable in our sin. We get comfortable in life. It's time we get uncomfortable. It's time that we strive for the Lord Jesus Christ, abounding in the work, abounding in the truth. This is the truth, and the truth is the Word of God. Abounding in it, learning it, adapting to it. In the beginning was the Word. Okay, that's the beginning. right? And the Word of God later became flesh and dwelt among us. But not only is God asking us to be faithful, right? if you're truly saved today, Your desires should not be the same as they used to be. God is asking us to be faithful and just, to live and to walk and to testify and to be examples because there's always going to be someone looking at you. Do you want to be that stumbling block today? Or do you want to be an example as the Lord Jesus Christ? To take the Bible and to show them how to be saved. Because our enemy, they control the power of fear. In Proverbs, excuse me, in Psalms 54, 3 and 4, the Bible says, What time I am afraid. I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Can I be real with you tonight? I promise I'm almost done. There could be so many things that you're afraid of in life. But you know the thing that I'd be most afraid of? If I'm not saved and I die and I'm on my way to hell. We can all die tonight walking out these doors. Every single one of us. Tomorrow is never promised. The thing that I would be most afraid of is dying and on my way to hell when I've had the opportunity to hear the word of God and get saved so many times. It's because our heart's rejecting the Lord. Not only do we see that our enemy controls the fear, but lastly, the victory does not belong to our enemy. It does not. In verse 7, the Bible says, And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley, and they that were on the other side of Jordan, think about this, they saw them retreat. On the other side of the valley, that's how many men there were that day fighting. Because you probably couldn't see just one or two fleeing. But a multitude of people running away. That means they're running out of the will of God, running away, doing what they please and what they want. But not only that, on the other side of the Jordan. You're like, what do you mean on the other side of the Jordan? If you look at a biblical map right below the Sea of Galilee, you see the Jordan River flowing out of it to the Dead Sea. Right? You have a sea and a sea and the Jordan in between. This is the same Jordan that Joshua brought the 12 tribes of Israel, left a monument in the middle of the river and a monument on the other side to show them and remind them what God had done. They retreated. This is the same Jordan River they crossed after 40 years of captivity. They took down the walls of Jericho. They fought these battles in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The power of God was upon them. The moment the king fell, they saw them fleeing. All, the Bible says, of the cities. The men of Israel fled. That Saul and his sons were dead. They forsook the cities and fled. The cities that God gave them. Our enemy does not control the power of victory. His name is Jesus. 
He died for you and I. The victory has already been won. We are living in fear and allowing the world to control us and keeps us from church, keeps us from witnessing, keeps us from testifying, keeps us from getting excited, keeps us from getting on fire. And the list goes on and on and on. How about we trust God? How about we be obedient? How about we walk by faith and not by sight? I'd rather be blind and walk into a wall than have sight and walk out of the will of God. You understand what I'm saying? They forsook everything they had. All because the king fell. I love our pastor very much, and he knows that. But he's just a man like all of us. He can fall just like you and I. The greatest thing we could ever do for him is pray. And to love him. You know, he probably hears all of our murmurs a lot. All our complaints and help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. But when's the last time he said, Pastor, I love you. I'm praying for you. Thank you. Because he can fall just like Saul did. You and I can fall just like Saul did. Because we allow the enemy to have the victory. Yet the victory is already ours. What are we doing with it? In Psalms 18, 39, the Bible says, For thou hast girded me with strength unto battle. Thou hast subdued unto me those that rose up against me. Our enemy's already been defeated. But every single day we are going to battle against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. And the most thing we're going to battle against is ourselves. You and I. The person you see in the mirror every single day. We're going to battle against the flesh because the flesh doesn't want you to. We're going to battle against ourselves because we want to do something just as Paul says, it's easy to do the things I don't want to do, yet it's so hard to do the things I should. Are we seeking the will of God as a church? Are we seeking the will of God for ourselves and what God wants us to do? The best place you can start is the Word of God. In Psalms 10, excuse me, 108, 13, the Bible says, through God, we shall do valiantly. For He is that shall tread down our enemies. That word valiantly means brave, willing to go forth and even die. Are you willing to die for the cause of Christ? If someone were walking that door tonight with a gun to all of our heads and says, forsake God or die. What would you do? Would you trust Him enough to die this day? And I hope that you would because we've trusted Him enough for salvation. The victory doesn't belong to our enemy. Our enemy sees victory because we quit and give up. Our enemy sees victory because we aren't, we aren't faithful to God. Our enemy sees victory because we are not steadfast. We are not unmovable. We're not abounding in the work of God. What we really are is stagnant. You know what happens to stagnant water? Mold begins to grow over, begins to have a stench, begins to die. The Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the living water. Those that quench thirst, quench no more. We have everything we need. Everything we need. God's provided it all the way. In closing tonight, if you look at the end of the chapter, verse 8, it says, And it came to pass on the morrow the Philistines came to strip and slain, strip the slain, and they found Saul and his three sons fallen at Mount Gilbo. Gilbo. And they cut off the head and stripped them of the armor and sent it to the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Astaroth, and fastened his body at the wall of Bashan. And the habits of Geshebarad heard which the Philistines had done to Saul. This tribe here is part of the tribe of Benjamin, which is part of the tribe of Judah. Excuse me, yeah, Judah. The Benjamites are part of the tribe of Judah. And they heard, it says, All the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and his body and his sons in the wall of Bashan and came to Jebusheth, 
and burnt them there, and they took their bones and buried them under the tree of Jebusha, Jebus, Jebahesh, Jebahesh and fastened seven days. You know what's most interesting about this group of men? The ten tribes and the two tribes, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. King Saul was really leading the ten tribes of Israel, and David, not even a king yet, was really leading the two tribes of Judah. And even though there was this separation of the two, the men knew that this was the anointed of God. They forsook, they stood up, and they went. Do you know every single day you and I are going to fail? We're going to sin. We're going to make mistakes. But by the grace and mercy of God, we're forgiven, if you ask. These men went that day and they recovered their bodies. They took them. They burnt them so that they would not be dishonored. They wanted to give King Saul, who was once a true man of God, the rightful way of death. In 1 Peter 2.15, the Bible says, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. There's going to be a day, a time, a place. People are going to try to come discourage you. They're going to try to get you out of the will of God. They're going to try to get you to stop coming to church. They're going to try to distract you. They're going to try to do anything they can to keep you from serving God. Don't listen to them. Witness to them. Don't follow men. Follow God. Don't seek applause or pat on the back. Follow seek God. You know, one day you'll be rewarded. One day. When you get to that judgment seat of Christ and God looks at your life, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm not looking forward to that day. I've wasted so many years of my life. Proverbs 19.21, the Bible says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Let me, let's, let's listen here. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. What's coming out of your heart? Because what's in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. Do people really know that you're a lover of the Lord? Are you like David and a man or woman after God's own heart? Are you seeking the counsel and the will of God? Are you seeking to please and to live for Him? What are we doing? Why do we come to church? Are you, are you here to be seen, to be known? Or are you here to hear from the Lord? Because God gives His messages to our pastor. In James 4.15, the Bible says, For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. God's will is plain or simple. Plain and simple. The first thing we need to do is be faithful. To be obedient. To walk not after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes of prior life. I'm not saying it's not going to be easy, but we need to start now. How about we pour out that stagnant water and get some more of that living water? How about we trust Christ more now than we ever have before? I'm not sure if you're looking around and keeping up with what's going on, but scholars and people have said there's no way the book of Revelation could happen because the Euphrates River could never dry up. Today, right now, this very moment, the Euphrates River is becoming dry. And you know what that is? That's the beginning of the end. The Bible says that there's four angels under that river. Four of the angels... That when Lucifer was kicked out of heaven, four of his followers, four of his major angels were placed under that river. And the moment that river becomes dry, those four angels will be loosened to come and try and rule this earth again. Ladies and gentlemen, if that doesn't get you excited, I'm not sure what will. That shouldn't make you fear or be afraid. We should start rejoicing because the King of kings and the Lord of lords is still on the throne. And His word is proving true. More truer than ever. People say, well, I can't believe. Well, there's going to be those who reject Him. But that doesn't mean we don't try. Amen. Lastly tonight in 1 Corinthians 1.10, the Bible says, Now I beseech thee, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all speak the same thing. And that there be no division among you, but that you perfectly join together in the same mind, in the same judgment. What does that mean? We as a church need to be on the same page. 
the same truth, the same doctrine. This is the Word of God. This is the Gospel. This is the light in a dark and dying world. This is the greatest gift that could ever be given and received. This is the way, the truth, and the life. This is the I Am. This is Jehovah Jireh. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not be like Saul and take our lives in our own hands and have our lives slain on the battlefield for our sake. How about we join together more than ever? How about we help God and go out there and invite people to church and as, as pastors ask to pray for the empty seats and fill the pews? How about we do our due diligence? Because God is asking us to be faithful. How about we strive to not miss Sunday school and Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night? Believe me, there's times I'm like, man, I'm tired. There's so much going on. I'm so stressed out. But what I've realized is the more I come here, the more each of us can be a blessing to each other. We can pray for each other. But most importantly is the Word of God. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It will change your life if you let it. It's not going to change your life when it's like this on a shelf. It's not going to change your life when it's like this on the, the dashboard of your car. It's not going to change your life when it's just sitting in your office or somewhere on a desk or something. It's going to change your life when you open it and you beg God to do something. Think about Saul. In the end, when Samuel came to him, he begged and begged and pleaded with Saul, Forgive me, Saul. When Saul brought to his attention, You're not living for the will of God. You're not doing what God commanded you. He begged and pleaded. Samuel left him. Never went back to him. The greatest thing about God is He will never leave us nor forsake us. The greatest thing about God is His promises are true yesterday, today, and forever. We need God right now. Our church needs God right now. We just went through a revival a few weeks ago. Revival's in our hearts. If we want revival, it's got to start here. Let's not be like Saul. Let's not take our life and the things we know, the things we want in our own hands. Let's trust the Lord Jesus Christ. With every head bowed and eyes closed, our Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, to open your word, to put our trust and faith in you. God, I pray for those who are here and those who are not here. Lord, I pray, we pray, I pray, Father God, as a church, we pour out the stagnant water. Father, I pray we get deeper into the living water. Help our thirst to be quenched, God. Help us to see you and understand you, to know you, to abide with you, to walk with you. God, help us to have the desire to have the best relationship we've ever had with you. God, I couldn't imagine living for you and dying and hearing that I did not know you. God, you've saved us. You've changed us, Lord. If, you're, if the, the people in this room are saved today and they know exactly what I'm talking about. Father, thank you for saving me. Thank you for changing me, for mending me and molding me. Lord, I know that I'm not perfect, God, but I pray you continue to work on me. Lord, I pray if, if, if the people that are in this room today, I pray that they bring all their burdens, all their heavy weights. Lord, I pray that all the things that are going on in their lives today, I pray they bring them to these old altars. Lord, the reason I say they're old because they've never changed. They're still the same as they were and they've always been. Help us to come to our knees and asking for the moving of the Spirit of God. Please fill this room with your Spirit. Lord, I pray the Spirit move through every heart and every mind. I pray that there not be a person here tonight that doesn't leave, Lord, not stirred and changed, thinking about what you've done and what you're going to do. Lord, again, I do pray if there be someone amongst us tonight that doesn't know you as the personal Savior, that today be the day of salvation. Lord, I pray you just hold their heart tonight. I pray you not allow them to even go to sleep or rest tonight without not knowing you. Lord, I pray that we do and be in the perfect will of God. For your way is perfect, Lord. I pray that we seek that as a church.